Hey guys, welcome back! So, Lucasfilm Games, later known as LucasArts, was one of my favorite developers and publishers since its early years. This is their story. Let's take a look. After licensing the rights of Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back to Parker Brothers, George Lucas was excited to expand into other areas of entertainment and video games was the obvious choice. So in the spring of 1982, Atari offered $1 million to Lucasfilm to create their own games group, grabbing also the rights for developing games based on the Star Wars movie franchise, which would last till early 90s. Therefore, by May 1st of 1982, George Lucas founded Lucasfilm Games, next door with special effects division Industrial Light and Magic, as part of his own Lucasfilm movie company. Peter Langston was seen as a unique guru inside the computer division at Lucasfilm and was the obvious choice to add the brand new games division. The entire division was more into technology than video games and their work on the entertaining aspect of technology was seen as research and development. The first year saw a strict collaboration with Atari from where came in 1984 Ball Blazer and Rescue on Fractalus. Sadly, beta versions of these games ended up leaking to pirate ants and circulated for months before the original release date, having a huge impact on sales. This slight hiccup affected the commercial relations between Lucasfilm and Atari, shaking the publishing agreement between both companies. By that time, Atari was also going through a profound crisis that dragged the US video game industry into the abyss, mainly because of the infamous $25 million investment in the rights to E.T. Home cartridge systems and cartridge games were in the bargain bin, so for Atari, there was any compelling reason to publish these games. The computer game industry was caught in the confusion of the cartridge crash, but even so, the major disc-based software publishers managed to survive. Credited as Lucasfilm's first title, Ball Blazer featured a musical score which reacted to the visual action on screen, an algorithmically generated technique designed by Peter Langston that was such a huge leap forward in technology, leaving all the surviving video game industry speechless. As for Rescue on Fractalus, it was highly inspired by the Star Wars movies, with the use of 3D fractal techniques from where the name comes from, and had the power to frighten players way before the horror genre was a normal thing in the video game industry. There was no fire button in the original version of the game, but when George Lucas came down to Lucasfilm Games' office, the first thing he asked for was a fire button. And the aliens jumping to our craft's windshield was also George's idea. George Lucas didn't have much interest in video games and barely showed up at the Skywalker Ranch. But when he did, he would transmit confidence to the teams behind Lucasfilm titles, giving just the necessary feedback. 1985 saw the release of another science fiction title, Coroni's Rift, followed by The Eidolon, a first-person fantasy RPG that also introduced scaling and depth to the environment. Then came the time for Habitat, inspired by Werner Vinge's novel True Names, that somewhat started the MMORPG genre back in 1986 with a beta test using the Quantum Link online service for the Commodore 64 available in the US and Canada, later rebranded to America Online. 1986 was also the year for Lucasfilm's first venture into the simulation video games. PHM Pegasus was a ship simulator that went on to selling more than 100,000 copies and soon followed by Strike Fleet in 1987 with a more strategic style of approach. But still, prior to this last one came in 1986 
Lucasfilm's first adventure game and first licensed title Labyrinth based on Jim Anson's movie of the same name and starred by David Bowie. It had this mixed test and graphical style of gameplay that separated the real-world initial setting from the colorful fantasy adventure that eagerly awaited the player. Until 1987 Lucasfilm developed their games and the distribution was as told in the hands of Atari in this particular case for their own systems. Activision, Epix and Electronic Arts were also Lucasfilm's publishing partners for the home computer versions. So by October of 1987 came Maniac Mansion, Lucasfilm's first venture into the lucrative and growing business of video game publishing and the title that gave Lucasfilm games that extra boost of popularity placing them on the map. Ron Gilbert's laziness was what originated the SCUM interface, firstly introduced in Maniac Mansion. It had this revolutionary ability to switch between characters so that we could solve various types of puzzles. Maniac Mansion was a commercial success and was soon followed by another great graphic adventure, Zack McCracken's and the Alien Mindbenders in late 1988, with an upgraded scum interface and also introducing Steve Purcell as the responsible for its cover art and for future Lucasfilm and LucasArts releases. Still in 1988 the first Lucasfilm flight simulator was made available. Battlehawks 1942, set in the Pacific region and the first of a trilogy of World War II flight simulators that would have a sequel a year later by the name Their Finest Hour, centered around the Battle of Britain and featuring a bunch of unique characteristics that really set the game apart from all other available by then. Lucasfilm Games had found its own way into the industry with the point-and-click graphic adventure genre that was revealing so popular by the end of the 80s that it was perfectly obvious that the man in the hat would also jump on board that carriage. The movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was a huge commercial success and to be able to embrace all video game systems available by then, an action game was developed alongside the graphic adventure. A curious fact was that Indy could not look exactly like Harrison Ford, cause the creative team composed by Ron Gilbert, David Fox, Steve Purcell and Noah Falstein didn't have the rights to the actor's image. The graphic adventure of The Last Crusade ended up being the first Lucasfilm title to sell more than 250,000 units and also had an FM Towns Japanese release on CD that included an exclusive CD quality soundtrack. As you know, the FM Towns was one of the first computers to use a CD-ROM drive. A single speed CD-ROM drive, yeah. Pipe Mania was also released in this time period. It was initially developed by the assembly line for the Amiga and a year later ported by Lucasfilm Games to a bunch other systems being also renamed to Pipe Dream. It's a brilliant and addictive puzzle game in where we simply have to connect a certain number of pipe pieces for that the liquid passes through without spilling out. 1990 came along with Loom, another point-and-click graphic adventure with a unique musical interface that was even advertised on yet another Lucasfilm graphic adventure. In fact, one of the most fondly remembered and hilarious titles from Lucasfilm games, The Secret of Monkey Island. I invite you all to check my video that celebrates the 25 years of The Secret of Monkey Island, packed with interesting facts that surround its development. Along with The Secret of Monkey Island came an action game by the name of Night Shift, in where we play the role of a worker in a factory owned by industrial might and logic. Yeah, that's right, might and logic, and we must ensure that the factory is working properly. It was also in 1990 that a reorganization of the Lucas companies took place and thus Lucasfilm Games became part of the Lucas Arts Entertainment Company along with Industrial Light and Magic and Skywalker Sound. 
Later, industrial light and magic would merge with Skywalker Sound into Lucas Digital Limited and LucasArts, the official and final name of the game's division. They moved to newer and bigger facilities and also started publishing their own gaming magazine, The Adventurer, that would feature announcements of their upcoming titles and interviews with the developers and would be around till 1996. 1991 came along and with it, the third of Lucasfilm Games' flight simulator series, only available for DOS machines. Secret weapons of the Luftwaffe, more focused on action than on simulation that depicts the more advanced German aircraft technology against the Allied obsolete fleet during World War II. Also in 1991 and for the first time, the license to develop video games based on the Star Wars movie franchise was finally in the hands of its rightful owner. So, based on the first two movies of the Star Wars franchise, came two titles for Sega and Nintendo 8-bit systems, Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back. This last one was exclusive to the NES and the Game Boy. If it wasn't for a license for development of video games based in the Star Wars universe being in the hands of Atari during the 80s, we would probably never see amazing original and groundbreaking titles like Ballblazer, Rescue on Fractalus, Labyrinth, Maniac Mansion, Zack McCracken, The Secret of Monkey Island, etc. The sequel to the successful Monkey Island would arrive in late 1991 with Lichuk's Revenge, one of the first titles with the brand new LucasArts logo stamped on the cover. This second adventure takes Guybrush on a quest to find a mysterious treasure and it featured an easy mode for beginners and for magazine reviewers, as stated by the developers on the back of the box. Luchuk's Revenge also introduced the iMuse interactive music system, developed by Michael Land and Peter McConnell, that simply synchronizes music with the visual action on screen. And it made all the difference. This system was patented by LucasArts and used in all their adventure games since. The sequel to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade arrived in June of 1992. The fate of Atlantis is, as told on my video about my personal top 10, my favorite point-and-click graphic adventure of all time. It is what every indie fan wanted. The perfect adventure that really should be turned into a full-length feature film. The game's multipath approach inspired players to replay it over and over. The beautiful locations, the interesting characters, the music and voice acting, the well thought out puzzles, all these ingredients were very well mixed up and offered an overwhelming plot that grabbed the player right from the beginning. Just like The Last Crusade, The Fate of Atlantis had also an action game, a quite forgettable one. The graphic adventure was so good that practically no one plays the action game designed by attention to detail that loosely follows the plot of its point-and-click counterpart. Also in the summer of 92 came an original game exclusive to the NES, Defenders of Dynatron City, that was praised for its unique superhero team, but ended up receiving really bad reviews mainly due to its poor hit detection. By the end of the year, Super Star Wars was released for the Super Nintendo, an amazing run-and-gun platform game that features multiple playable characters and in where we could also fly an X-Wing and drive a land speeder. It was the Super Nintendo equivalent of the 1991 Star Wars NES game. 1993 would bring amazing titles for MS-DOS players, it was, for me, a year of transition when I embraced PC gaming with arms wide open. 
I didn't have an hard drive on my Amiga, so I became tired of the dreadful disk swapping that recent games obliged. This year saw the dawn and rise of the talky CD-ROM era that allowed adventure game characters to actually speak their own words of dialogue during gameplay. Among others, the Fate of Atlantis was re-released in an enhanced CD-ROM version that featured more than 8000 lines of dialogue. Volunteer. All those years developing combat flight simulators came to fruition in 1993. The team behind Battlehawks 1942, their finest hour and secret weapons of the Luftwaffe gained the amount of experience needed to finally bring Star Wars X-Wing. One of the first titles that I played on my brand new IBM PC and ended up completely addicted to it. The feeling of being at the controls of an X-Wing, Y-Wing and A-Wing, performing all sorts of missions and engaging TIE Fighters was mind-boggling! Even now, X-Wing is so damn enjoyable to play. It was the first Star Wars title to also be published by LucasArts and one of the first simulation games to include 3D polygon graphics for spaceships, instead of less detailed bitmap graphics that were normally used in flight simulators. It went on being one of the best-selling PC games of 1993. And by June arrived the sequel to Maniac Mansion, Day of the Tentacle, another favorite of mine, that brought the spirit of the original and hugely improved and expanded over it. Dave Grossman returned after showing all his writing skills in The Secret of Monkey Island and once again, and along with Tim Schafer, wrote this overwhelming story in where we have to solve puzzles whilst traveling through time exploring different periods of history in an attempt to stop the evil purple tentacle from Take on the world. It was released firstly on floppy disk, with voice acting present only on cutscenes. There was a really complicated task to technically accomplish with success. So that you guys can have an idea, the whole game with animations, sounds and the scum engine is as big as this JPEG that is scrolling up the screen that has around 8 megs. But they've managed to pull it off and later was also released a CD-ROM version with voice acting throughout the whole game. Uh -oh. June also saw the release of Super Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back for the Super Nintendo, another huge hit on the console which improved upon the 1991 release for the NES. It was the sequel to Super Star Wars and, as according to the movie in which it was based, introduced Force powers and Luke's ability to block attacks and deflect blaster incoming fire using his trustful lightsaber. Darth Vader will also make its appearance in this amazing game. The Japanese version would only arrive in December and Paul Regions would receive the game only by February of 1994. Zombies Ate My Neighbors or Just Zombies in Paul Regions was published by Konami arriving firstly in June of 93 in the US. It's a run and gun video game that features various elements inspired by horror movies containing a few violent scenes that were even censored in Australia and in many European countries. Nintendo ordered for the blood to be removed or replaced by purple ooze and in Europe enemies with chainsaws would be replaced by lumberjacks with axes and this version would only be released in January of 1994. This was even before the ESRB was created. Nowadays it's considered a cult classic. By the end of 93, another Star Wars title saw the light of day, Rebel Assault that took advantage of the CD-ROM fever that seemed to have contaminated the industry. Full motion video was emerging and was seen as something from the future and everyone wanted to have a slice of it. The PC and Mac CD-ROM, the Sega CD and the 3DO was where we could find Rebel Assault. It failed to reach the standards of other Star Wars titles, but all the CD frenzy of the time turned it into a classic selling more than 1 million copies. And to close 1993 with a golden key, another marvelous point and click graphic adventure was released. Sam and Max Eat the Road. 
This one was based on the original 1987 comic book series by Steve Purcell himself and it takes us on a mission to find Bruno, a missing Bigfoot, from a carnival. That mission is assigned to a couple of freelance police officers, a naked and hyperactive bunny named Max and a dog named Sam. Two LucasArts trademarks were present in Sam and Max, the delicious humor and, as well, their unique design rule to never let the player die. This way players didn't have to worry about constantly saving their game. 1994 was a, let's say, normal year with few notable releases. Super Star Wars Return of the Jedi was made available around June for the Super Nintendo and, unlike its predecessors, received a couple of bad reviews from specialized press and, at the same time, praise for the amazing musical score and the excellent graphics. But that didn't stop it from being awarded by Electronic Gaming Monthly as the Best Movie 2 Game Award of 1994 and, a year later, Best Game Gear title of 1995. And by July, the sequel to X-Wing arrived, Star Wars TIE Fighter. This time around we could fight for the Empire under the command of Darth Vader himself and other Imperial commanders. It features an amazing and compelling story filled with tense political intrigue that amazed critics and players alike, ending up being re-released a year later in a collector's CD-ROM edition with enhanced Super VGA graphics, cutscenes and brand new voiceovers. It was also the first Star Wars video game to take advantage of LucasArts' IMU system to create such an amazing and involving musical environment. The summer was gone, so LucasArts would prepare a couple of snacks for the winter season and exclusive to Nintendo fans. The first was Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventures for the Super Nintendo, released in the US by October and in July of 95 in Paul regions that would feature 2D platform action based on all three films from the Indiana Jones trilogy. The job was handed over to Factor 5, best known for their Turrican games, for the most popular Commodore computers around and also the Super NES and Genesis Mega Drive, being their first well-succeeded collaboration. Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures also had a Genesis Mega Drive complete version ready for publishing that was even reviewed on a bunch of Sega magazines, but unfortunately saw a last-minute cancellation. By November, a sort of sequel to Zombies Ate My Neighbors arrived exclusively for the Super NES, Ghoul Patrol. It was planned to also be available for Sega fans, but its development was altered and eventually cancelled. This one wasn't supposed to be related to Zombies Ate My Neighbors in any way, but in order for it to sell, they decided to call it a sequel to Zombies and use the same characters. It would eventually achieve a good commercial performance due to the positive reviews from the press. Also, during 1994, a package of Star Wars screensavers on CD-ROM was placed on store shelves that offered, as said, a bunch of Star Wars-related screensavers for Windows and Macintosh, like the Cantina, Darth Vader, the jump to hyperspace, posters from A New Hope, blueprints of the Millennium Falcon, etc. 1995 started with another Super Nintendo exclusive, Metal Warriors, only available in the US and seen as an improved Cybernator, extremely fun, featuring futuristic platforming action with detailed graphics and the ability to leave the mech suit, that was what separated Metal Warriors from all other similar titles previously available. The mid-90s were huge in technological advancements with brand new consoles in the horizon and 3D accelerated graphics for the PC that would allow the creation of even more immersive game experiences that LucasArts could and should use on future story-driven adventures based on their movie franchises, bringing its rich worlds to life in such a way that no one had ever seen and experienced before. While playing around with those new consoles and new hardware, LucasArts began experimenting new genres. So they came up with my favorite FPS ever made, Star Wars Dark Forces, released for the PC and Mac by February in the US and by June in Europe. It broke so many barriers and overcame a bunch other obstacles, improving the Doom formula to a higher level. 
LucasArts' first venture into the FPS genre couldn't have been more successful than it was. Dark Forces contributed to the evolution of the genre and, for the first time, we could be inside and completely absorbed in the Star Wars universe and in a real-time 3D environment. We play as a former Imperial officer who joined the Rebellion to try to stop the Empire's Dark Trooper project. A year later, it was also released for the PlayStation, but had severe framerate issues that stopped it from being as successful as the DOS and Macintosh versions. Full Throttle arrived in April, again from the creative minds of Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman, achieving record sales for point-and-click graphic adventures of over 1 million units. The bar. It was a bit short, but while it lasted, was a hell of a ride. Amazing animation, astonishing voice performances and a superb soundtrack turned Full Throttle into a cult classic among the genre. While we were at it, can you identify this voice? One of Malcolm's psychiatric sessions. Yeah, it's Mark Hamill, best known as Luke Skywalker that also provided his iconic voice to the more recent Arkham franchise as the Joker himself, among many other roles in all sorts of video games and animated TV series. Act one, scene one. Even with the arrival of brand new 32-bit consoles, the Super Nintendo continued to be treated with respect by LucasArts releasing by October Big Sky Trooper, a weird sci-fi action RPG in where we simply have to save the entire galaxy traveling across 100 different planets. And staying on a sci-fi scenario, another amazing point-and-click adventure game came about in late 1995. The Dig, based on an original story written by Steven Spielberg. It was LucasArts' title with the longest development time, but the wait was worth it. It had a darker and obscure tone to its own plot, totally different from all other point-and-click graphic adventures by LucasArts. It was also a bit too difficult, that resulted in a few unfavorable reviews, but voice acting and the soundtrack were highly praised and critically acclaimed. In my top 10 point-and-click graphic adventures video, you can discover a few more curious facts about the development process of this masterpiece. Check it out! 1995 wouldn't end without another Star Wars title, so by November, Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 The Eden Empire was available for PC, PlayStation and Mac. It came two years after the first of the series, bringing back to the wonders of the full motion video technology. It was similar to its predecessor in all respects, with 15 missions and even the chance to fly the Millennium Falcon. It was seen by the press as an interactive movie, with brand new Star Wars live action video footage, in where we only had to move the stick around and press a button at a certain moment to advance in the story. Mid-90s was for LucasArts a time for experimentation, embracing different genres and weird types of games, mainly due to the growing evolution of gaming platforms and operating systems popping out all over the place. From those experiments came in April of 96, Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures for Windows PCs and Mac OS. It is basically an adventure game that players could finish in just one hour, but the novelty was that it had a random engine that, every time we played it, a completely new and different adventure is generated. By June, another unique title arrived on store shelves. After life, something between a god game and a strategic simulation in where we're invited to create heaven or hell to reward or punish inhabitants of this alien planet. As you can see, LucasArts was trying different stuff outside their comfort zone, so also in June came a children's adventure game by the name Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion for PC and Mac that tell the tale of a snail seeking to save their animal buddies in a fantasy world setting. Mortimer, the main character, has the ability to turn his own shell into an aircraft or a submarine solving various sorts of biology-related puzzles. By December, LucasArts makes their return to the Star Wars franchise with Star Wars Shadows of the Empire, initially for the Nintendo 64 and a year later also for PC. 
Its story is set between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and was LucasArts' very first title for Nintendo's brand new 64-bit console that arrived a couple of months prior. The game featured many unique locations and vehicles, just like this snow speeder on the ice planet of Oth, all in glorious full 3D. Most Eisley in Tatooine and the sewers of the Imperial City are also featured in this project that started back in 1994 and was one of the most stressful games to make cause LucasArts wanted to release it right after the official launch of the Nintendo 64 in North America. And why not a first-person shooter set in the Wild West? Outlaws was released in March of 1997 and has that spaghetti flavor whilst telling the story of James Anderson in a mission to avenge the death of his wife and daughter. It preceded the cel-shading animation by years and its visual art style, story and real-time first-person 3D perspective was hailed by many, but Quake and the yet-to-be-released Half-Life quickly erased Outlaws from the map. Off the record, 1997 was a year of astounding releases, so it was perfectly obvious that other titles would evaporate in thin air. Another title from LucasArts Desktop Adventures arrived also in March for Windows, Star Wars Yoda Stories. It also came two years later in December of 1999 for the Game Boy Color and we get to play as Luke Skywalker completing his training with Yoda to become a Jedi. Just like in Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures, the missions are procedurally generated so that we get a new objective every time you start the game. By that time, the very first Lucasfilm game was resurrected and remade for the Sony PlayStation. Bold Laser Champions! The project was handed over to German studio Factor 5, but was aiming only to those who played the original from 1984. In April came one of the most anticipated games, Star Wars X-Wing vs TIE Fighter, exclusive for PC, that would later also receive the Balance of Power expansion pack. What was awesome about this new title was, finally, the introduction of the online multiplayer space combat, the ultimate battle between the Alliance and the Empire, in where up to 7 players could cooperatively play over LAN and 3 over the Internet. The Balance of Power expansion released later in the year by December to be more precise brought new ships and an extensive single player campaign for those that had limited access to the world wide web. Soon after by summer arrived something different for console players, Erx Adventures. The PlayStation version had an international release whilst the Saturn port was only available in the US. It's a simple two-player action game in a similar style to Zombies Ate My Neighbors, set in ancient times in where we could pick Hercules, Atlanta or Jason on a quest to defeat Hades and save the beautiful Persephone, the goddess of nature. I have Persephone. But the best was reserved for later in the year. Star Wars Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2 was released for PC, the sequel to the groundbreaking Dark Forces from 1995. Needless to say that it became another of my favorite first-person shooters ever created, that features a brand new 3D engine and sees the return of Kyle Katarn, now as a Jedi, with the main goal of stopping not one nor two, but seven Dark Jedi from unleashing the powers of an Eden Jedi burial ground. While playing we're constantly challenged on picking a side, the light or the dark side of the force. An expansion pack arrived on February of 98, Mysteries of the Sith, that included 15 multiplayer maps that allowed up to 8 players online or over LAN. It also offered newer force powers and a new single player story set 5 years after the events of the main story of Dark Forces 2. Soon after came the long-awaited third title of the adventures of everyone's favorite pirate. The Curse of Monkey Island. Six years after Luchuk's revenge, Guybrush is still hoping to marry Elaine, but after giving her unknowingly a cursed ring, 
she is transformed into a golden statue and about to marry his greatest enemy, Luchuk himself. Hey, I'm ignoring you. The Curse of Monkey Island was the first in the series to include voice acting and with a more cartoonish style of approach. Ron Gilbert's writings were missed, many complained about the game's ending. Despite that, The Curse of Monkey Island received a lot of praise by journalists and gamers alike and was the last game to use the scum engine. Ron Gilbert never thought that his engine would be used in so many other titles beyond Maniac Mansion and he created it, cause he didn't like to type while playing, for instance, Sierra's King's Quest games. It made more sense just to point at stuff and interact with objects using a mouse, a joystick or a gamepad. An extremely intuitive system that allowed designers to create amazing worlds and locations being at the same time cross-platform. By the end of the year, it was quite weird to see a fighting game coming from LucasArts Studios. Even more weird was that it's a fighting game with Star Wars characters in it. Star Wars Masters of Tarascasi was released exclusively for the PlayStation that even had the help of specialists from Industrial Light and Magic to create the animations for the characters using motion capture. Sadly, it's considered one of the worst fighting games ever made. 1998 started with a real-time strategy title, Star Wars Rebellion, also known as Supremacy in the UK and Ireland, in where players battled the control of the galaxy as a commander of the Galactic Empire or the Rebel Alliance. The choice was ours. Star Wars Behind the Magic was an interactive multimedia CD-ROM that would arrive by September of 98. It included rare stills and footage from the original Star Wars trilogy and also a sneak peek into the Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. LucasArts would also venture into the edutainment business, creating their own subsidiary for educational purposes, Lucas Learning, and their first product was Star Wars Droid Works. An educational adventure that teaches the player about energy, magnetism, simple machines, light, force and motion. It was so well received by critics and parents that ended up winning at least 16 awards from November of 1998 until October of 2001. Shortly after, Grim Fandango arrived with style and brought the story of Manny Calavera that works for the Department of Death in the Land of the Dead. His job is simple, take people from the land of the living and escort them through a four-year journey across the underworld. However, a conspiracy is underway, so an amazing and original adventure by Tim Schafer awaits the player. It was also the first LucasArts adventure to use full 3D graphics overlaid pre-rendered ones and the game's interface was also quite unique, ditching the traditional mouse control and replacing it with a keyboard, a joystick or a gamepad. Hey, who the, who's 1998 would end with another huge hit, Star Wars Rogue Squadron for the Nintendo 64 and PC being the first of three games in the Rogue Squadron series. In this one, co-developed by LucasArts and Factor 5, we're invited to be Luke Skywalker himself and take part in huge X-Wing dogfights throughout the galaxy as a member of the elite group known as Rogue Squadron. A spiritual presence of Shadows of the Empire is seen in the Snow Speeder level in a newer and fresher way, and it was one of the first titles to take advantage of the Nintendo 64 RAM pack, allowing 640x480 display resolution instead of the native 320x240. By that time, LucasArts were extremely pleased with their collaboration with German developer Factor 5 and used Factor 5's brand new engine for Rogue Squadron, an engine that could draw large terrain maps. That level from Shadows of the Empire, in where we controlled a snow speeder during the Battle of Oth, was the main inspiration for Rogue Squadron. 
They had also to ask permission for Nintendo to use the memory expansion pack to achieve higher graphical quality, cause according to Nintendo, the expansion pack should be used solely for hardware peripherals. However, Iguana Entertainment had already used the expansion pack for that same purpose on Turok 2 Seeds of Evil, so Nintendo had to also allow Factor 5 to use it for that intent. Strange was that Lucasfilm Limited, George Lucas Movie Company, wouldn't grant access to the Star Wars library of sound effects. Instead, they provided Factor 5 with really low rate files that sounded horrible. So they ended up using sounds captured from VHS tapes and along with their own sound drivers were able to immerse the player in this incredible audio-visual experience with over 80 minutes of high-quality stereo sound. In the end, the game's producer stated it sold about 100 times better than anybody expected. 1999 began with one of my favorite LucasArts Star Wars titles and for me the pinnacle of the X-Wing series. Star Wars X-Wing Alliance. Exclusive to the PC, it offered enhanced graphics and fully 3D cockpits, with more than 50 missions in the single player campaign and 5 for multiplayer action. The most fondly remembered moments were the ability to hyper jump from one area to another and to fly the Millennium Falcon in the assault on the second Death Star, just like we saw in the movie Return of the Jedi. And right before the premiere and the beginning of a brand new trilogy of Star Wars movies came in April the first two titles based on the Phantom Menace. Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace and Star Wars Episode 1 Racer. This last one offered super fast and super addictive gameplay in 21 different race courses across 8 different worlds and was generally well received by the gaming press and players being also the very first time that LucasArts developed a video game for the Dreamcast. As for the game that shares the exact title as the movie, it was available for PC and PlayStation and developed by Big Ape Productions for LucasArts, receiving really poor reviews but ending up as a bestseller in the UK. It followed closely the movie's plot, a sort of interactive way of replaying the movie, and we get to play it as Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, Queen Amidala and Captain Panaka. An insider's guide to Star Wars Episode 1 was also released for PC and Mac, which featured the making of the original prequel and, as well, an interactive behind the scenes at the creation of the Phantom Menace. By October, Star Wars Pit Droids for PC arrives from Lucas Learning Limited, a puzzle game intended for kids that even older Star Wars fans will be addicted to. The detailed graphics, the complex gameplay and its catchy soundtrack are the ingredients that makes it an extremely fun puzzler to play with kids, or simply by ourselves. 1999 wouldn't end without another of my favorite LucasArts titles. Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, released firstly for PC and a year later, also for the N64, but this last one was only available in the US. This time around, Indy returns in a real-time 3D action-adventure game set in 1947 during the Cold War, in where we have to race around the globe searching for parts of the mysterious infernal machine. During that process, the Soviets will try to make sure we fail. Sophia Apgood returns from the fate of Atlantis not to be our partner, but as a CIA agent. After proving all his skills with the fate of Atlantis, Al Barwood returns to write the Infernal Machine's overwhelming story, also designing and directing its development. There was even a Game Boy Color version of this game, also very well received by gamers. I've already reviewed it in the past, it was one of my early videos, feel free to check that one out. 2000 saw the release of a bunch of other Star Wars related titles, mainly for consoles. Even so, the year started with a PC exclusive, Star Wars Force Commander, a 3D real-time strategy title that gave players the ability to command troops in massive battles. 
Soon after came the first console exclusive title of the year, Star Wars Episode 1 Jedi Power Battles for PlayStation, Dreamcast and Game Boy Advance. It's a simple action-driven adventure game with a mix of platform and beat-em-up action in where we get to play as a Jedi and defeat once and for all Darth Maul on one last battle that takes place on Naboo. Later in the year Guybrush returned in 3D. Escape from Monkey Island was the fourth title in the series and the beginning of a new era for LucasArts original adventures with its debut on the brand new PlayStation 2. There you go, Mr. Marley. PC and Mac versions were released by November of 2000 and the PS2 port would come only by June of 2001. But this last one had a slightly higher number of polygons and less pre-rendered stuff. Well, don't just stand. PC gamers so used to the mouse found a bit difficult the keyboard and joystick controls, but the PS2 version was surprisingly extremely well received. The final couple of months also saw the release of two other Star Wars titles. Star Wars Demolition for PlayStation and Dreamcast and Star Wars Episode 1 Battle for Naboo for Nintendo 64 followed by a PC port that would arrive only by March of 2001. Star Wars Demolition was developed by LucasArts and Luxoflux using the Vigilante 8 game engine and it's basically a combat game with those well-known Star Wars vehicles in a contest organized by Jabba the Hutt. As for Battle for Naboo, it was the return of Factor 5 to the Star Wars universe, bringing back that Rogue Squadron amazing feeling of aerial combat. The N64 original version was another victory both for Factor 5 and LucasArts, but the PC port was met with huge critics on the controls and the poor graphical quality. 2001 started with Star Wars Starfighter, LucasArts' first game developed in-house for the PlayStation 2 and by November, in a special edition developed by Secret Level Inc, later acquired by Sega, and as a launch title for Microsoft's first console, the Xbox, that had just arrived in US stores. By January of 2002 it was also released for the PC, but it's better to simply forget this last one. By that time LucasArts was focused on releasing and conquering the console market and PC gamers and fans of Star Wars could only be pissed. Back in the 90s LucasArts was seen as a developer of awesome PC games but in this new millennium that idea vanished completely. Even so the PlayStation original version of Starfighter was a joy to play and a reminder of those amazing titles from the X-Wing trilogy from the 90s available for PC and Mac owners. Lucas Learning Limited also entered the console market with Star Wars Super Bombad Racing exclusively for the PlayStation 2. Released in April, it would appeal to a younger audience with a sort of Mario Kart style of gameplay, with well-known characters from Star Wars Episode 1, with huge ads that ended up highly criticized by fans of the franchise. Later in the year, LucasArts would try to make amends with fans with the release of Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds for PC and Mac users. It was another real-time strategy game, this time around developed by LucasArts and Ensemble Studios, best known for their highly successful Age of Empires series, built with an enhanced version of the Age of Empires game engine. Fans of Star Wars and of this particular genre were extremely pleased with it and by May of 2002, two days before the release of the next entry in the new movie trilogy, Galactic Battlegrounds received an expansion pack, the clone campaigns that enlarged the game's already huge scope by including large-scale battle scenarios from Star Wars Episode 2 The Clone Wars. 18th of November of 2001 would also remain in video gaming history for two reasons. It was the launch date of the Nintendo GameCube in the US and also the day when LucasArts with compliments from Factor 5 released exclusively for that console, one of the best Star Wars video games ever made. Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. 
Here we take us back to the original Star Wars trilogy. With overwhelming movie-like visuals and astonishing audio environment in full Dolby Pro Logic 2 surround sound during the most famous battles in movie history, like the Death Star Trench Run and the gigantic conflict in the ice planet of Oth. 2001 was the year of firsts for LucasArts, the first PS2 game, the first GameCube game and by December the first Xbox exclusive game, Star Wars Obi-Wan. However, it was a failed attempt. It was initially intended to be a sequel to Dark Forces 2, but due to unstable performance on PC, it was targeted for the powerful Xbox that was about to be launched in the United States. LucasArts ended up recognizing that the over-reliance on the Star Wars franchise was, as stated, reducing the quality of their final products. So they've announced that future releases would be at least 50% non-related to Star Wars. That statement ended up falling into the ground because many of those supposed original titles were either unsuccessful or cancelled during development, what consequently and accidentally led to the release of a ton of new Star Wars games that were already in production. So, Star Wars Racer Revenge would arrive in early 2002, developed by Rainbow Studios exclusively for the PlayStation 2, that would allow players to engage in even more gruesome and fearsome pod races than in its predecessor. In this one, we could run opponents into walls and take them out of the race before it was over. Mess with Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast followed, also from third-party developers for PC, Mac, Xbox and GameCube, and saw the return of Kyle Katarn in this first-person action game that used the highly popular Quake 3 Arena game engine, climbing its way to the top of the charts and becoming one of the best-selling first-person action games of the year. Along with Jedi Outcast came another console-exclusive title developed by LucasArts themselves. Star Wars Jedi Starfighter for PlayStation 2 and Xbox, and a sequel to Star Wars Starfighter, which included a sneak peek to the new Star Wars Episode 2 movie that would arrive two months later. In this one we could fly the Jedi Starfighter and use force powers while in the cockpit, across 15 land and space missions and other two-player cooperative missions. By the end of the year another two console exclusives, Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Bounty Hunter. This last one was developed indoors and also known as Django Fat in Japan, telling the story of how Django became the most famous bounty hunter of the Star Wars universe. It was a title in where practically everyone at LucasArts was involved, from industrial light and magic to create the game's CG cinematic sequences and Skywalker sound that provided the game's sound design. As for the Clone Wars, initially available for PS2 and GameCube, we play the role of a Jedi Knight leading the Republic Army into the gigantic ground battles of the Clone Wars, seen in the movie Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. For the third to keep the flame alive and for fans of classic LucasArts titles, a compilation CD titled The Best of LucasArts Original Soundtracks was released, featuring music from a few of their greatest games like The Dig, the Monkey Island series, Grim Fandango and Outlaws. Taking a break from the Star Wars franchise, 2003 started with a new Indiana Jones adventure, Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, for Xbox, PlayStation 2, PC and Mac. Developed by The Collective Inc., it takes place in 1935, right before the events of the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and we're searching for the tomb of China's first emperor. This last Indiana Jones adventure wasn't very welcomed by the gaming press, pointing out a few graphical and sound issues on the console versions. Personally, I've enjoyed it a lot. By June came another experiment from LucasArts and Gladly, only available for PS2 owners, RTX Red Rock, an action-adventure game designed by Al Barwood in where we have to investigate the loss of communication between Earth and Earth's colony on Mars, that is believed it was attacked by alien forces known as LEDs. 
Soon after came another PC blockbuster. Star Wars Galaxies and Empire Divided, that later received three expansion packs, Jump to Light Speed, Rage of the Wookiees and Trials of Obi-Wan. It was the first Star Wars MMORPG developed by Varant Interactive and Sony Online Entertainment in where we could explore the Star Wars universe and become a Jedi, a smuggler, a ranger, a merchant or a bounty hunter. The game events were set between the end of Episode 4 A New Hope and Episode 5 The Empire Strikes Back, including once more the Battle of Oth that is such a reference in the Star Wars fictional setting. But the biggest surprise would come after Star Wars Galaxies and from Bioware. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, initially for Xbox and later also for PC. This RPG is set in the Star Wars universe, 4000 years before the events depicted in Episode 1 movie, takes us through many well-known Star Wars locations, in where we interact with other characters, performing side quests that will influence our path into the light or the dark side of the Force. We can turn our character into a powerful Jedi, a merciless Sith or something else. It received universal acclaim, both for the PC and Xbox versions, winning several awards including Game of the Year 2003. Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy for PC, Mac and Xbox was also another huge hit in 2003, a first and third person shooter developed by Raven Software for home computers and Vicarious Visions for Microsoft's console and as opposed to Jedi Outcast. We immediately start with a lightsaber, something highly praised by gamers and reviewers. Soon after, the GameCube would receive the highly anticipated exclusive Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike, again developed by Factor 5, that ended up as a huge disappointment, cause players were expecting something bigger after the success of the previous title in the Rogue Squadron series. In this one, we had the ability to leave our fighter and take part in ground battles and as well enter and pilot many other vehicles in certain missions. The end of the year saw the release of three distinct titles away from those highly popular LucasArts franchises, so by October Gladius saw the light of day for the current gen consoles, the GameCube, PS2 and Xbox. It takes the player back to ancient times in this tactical RPG in where we must build a school of gladiators and take them into battle, revealing itself as a huge success on all three platforms and a breath of fresh air from LucasArts that developed Gladius themselves. By November, Secret Weapons over Normandy landed on PC, Xbox and PlayStation 2, reviving that long-lost franchise of World War II flight simulators that offered over 20 historical aircraft to take out for a spin, 15 campaign missions and 20 optional challenge missions. Between assignments we can even upgrade our plane, an astounding achievement and a huge success that shows that LucasArts is also capable of offering players other exciting titles miles away from their supposed comfort zone. It was developed by Totally Games, a company founded by former Lucasfilm LucasArts employee Lawrence Holland that developed games almost exclusively for LucasArts for over a decade and responsible for the titles from the Secret Weapons and X-Wing series. Another success came in December of 2003 with Armed and Dangerous for Xbox and PC, a first and third person shooter developed by Planet Moon Studios that featured several unusual characters, weapons and lots of humor being both versions of the game extremely well received by the press and gamers. It was soon followed by an original chess-like strategy game developed by the collective Inc. Wrath Unleashed, released in early 2004, involving gods and the four elements in an epic battle. However, the best was reserved for later in the year with the release of Star Wars Battlefront, developed by Pandemic Studios initially for PC, Xbox and PlayStation 2, to coincide with the release of the original trilogy on DVD. 
It's a first and third person shooter played basically as a conquest game, and multiplayer over the internet was huge and something quite remarkable, with 64 players simultaneously on both the PC and Mac versions with also more than 25 usable vehicles. The console versions allow 32 players via GameSpy and Xbox Live. Right after Battlefront came the sequel to Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, subtitled The Sith Lords, developed this time around by Obsidian Entertainment and released firstly for Xbox and later for PC, Mac and Linux. Set five years after the events of the first game, it places us in control of an exiled Jedi Knight in a time when the Jedi have been nearly exterminated by the Sith. So our mission is quite simple, gather the remaining forces and defeat the Sith, revealing a dark and obscure amazing plot. While enjoying the success that Star Wars Battlefront achieved, Pandemic Studios returned with Mercenaries Playground of Destruction, published by LucasArts in January of 2005 for PC, PS2 and Xbox. An action-adventure game set in an open-world environment and it features kind of stealth and reputation-based style of gameplay, in where we take control of one of three mercenaries and, to prevent a nuclear war, we must successfully complete each contract. And right after Mercenaries, LucasArts released to the public their brand new Star Wars related title, Republic Commando for PC and Xbox, an astounding first person technical shooter that uses Epic Games' powerful Unreal Engine. Criticized for offering a short experience, it was, on the other hand, praised for its story and combat that are set during the events of the movie Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. 2005 was also the year when their partnership with LEGO made its first steps into the video game business with LEGO Star Wars The Video Game, developed by Traveler's Tales and published firstly in March by LucasArts for practically all systems available by then, before and after the premiere of Episode 3, the final chapter of the prequel trilogy. It would allow players to relive the events of all three movies from the Star Wars prequel in a LEGO style and oriented for family fun, being extremely well received for that same reason. And by May, when the third movie was finally arriving to cinemas, Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith was also released for PC, Xbox, PS2, Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS, that was obviously based in scenes from the movie. Ubisoft Montreal was responsible for the portable versions that were considered the best from the whole bunch. The Collective Inc. developed the other console releases that even had the help of the stunt coordinator and lightsaber trainer from all the three prequel movies and he even appears in the game as a boss. By October arrived the moment that fans were eagerly waiting, the release of Star Wars Battlefront 2 for PC, Xbox, PS2 and even the PSP. Pandemic Studios returned to the series to create an even greater and immersive experience. It was released alongside the DVD of Revenge of the Sith and, unlike its predecessor, features a more narrative-based campaign along with new vehicles, characters, maps and missions. During these last two years, LucasArts went through a profound internal change under the tight belt of Jim Ward, appointed president of LucasArts back in April of 2004 that had shown all his skills marketing the movies Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. George Lucas felt that his game's division was putting out too many mediocre titles. Even the most popular ones weren't generating enough revenue to keep LucasArts afloat, so Ward's first actions were to cancel a few games already in development and reduce LucasArts' working force from 450 to 190 employees. As stated, Jim Ward came from the movie business and couldn't comprehend how games could be late. Star Wars Battlefront 2 was supposed to be a multiplayer only game, but Ward wanted a single player campaign a few months before it was released. Everyone said that it was impossible to achieve that in such less time. Even so, Pandemic and everyone at LucasArts involved in the project made it impossible and the game met its deadline and sold extremely well, also due 
to its gigantic marketing campaign. Prepare for the sequel to the best-selling Star Wars game of all time. Fight as a Jedi. Fight in space. Fight the battles any way you want. Star Wars Battlefront 2. On Tuesday, you fight again. Rated teen. Many other rush decisions were made in the next few years. Internally, LucasArts was seen as a madhouse run by people that weren't familiar with the development process of a video game that seemed to enjoy making huge last-minute modifications onto something that was on development for many months and even years. In 2006, LucasArts was composed by three development teams. Games came from third-party developers like Petroglyph Games that developed Star Wars Empire at War and its expansion pack Forces of Corruption. Traveler's Tales brought LEGO Star Wars 2 the original trilogy and from Frontier Developments, the makers of Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, came the chance of managing another theme park in Thrillville, a game oriented mostly for a younger audience. As said, by 2006, LucasArts was composed by three development teams, one focused on a future Indiana Jones project, another on The Force Unleashed, and the other just standing by, seeing all their concepts being crushed. Star Wars Rogue Squadron Trilogy, exclusive for the Xbox, Star Wars Imperial Commando, a sequel to Republic Commando, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 3, Star Wars Jedi Knight 3 Brink of Darkness and Jedi Master, Star Wars Smuggler, Star Wars Rebel Warrior, Star Wars Darth Maul, Star Wars Proteus, Star Wars First Assault, Rogue Squadron X-Wing vs TIE Fighter, an exclusive for the Xbox 360, and Star Wars Episode 7 Shadows of the Sith, all these internal projects were cancelled during Jim Ward's leadership. Besides those, there was Star Wars Battlefront 3. The job was handed over not to Pandemic Studios, but to Free Radical, renowned by their amazing GoldenEye and Perfect Dark video games for the N64 and the Time Splitter series for the sixth generation of consoles. It was on development for two years and looking really good, with the premise of taking the fight from the ground to the air and space and scheduled to be released in 2008. By that time, by February, Jim Ward stepped down as president of LucasArts, stating personal reasons, and was replaced for a couple of months by Howard Rothman. By April, Daryl Rodriguez, that came from Electronic Arts, stepped in when things started to go wrong during the development of Battlefront 3, leading to a harsh decision from LucasArts to stop funding Free Radical from missing their milestones, creating a tense working relationship between the two companies that even led Free Radical into a state of bankruptcy by the end of 2008. Even so, the Battlefront 3 project didn't die after that incident. LucasArts teamed up with developer Slant 6 Games, known for a few SOCOM titles, to create a new Star Wars Battlefront 3 from scratch, but it would also crash and burn, being vaporized in thin air. 2007 was another weak year for LucasArts, with only two published games from, again, third-party developers. A sequel to Thrillville, subtitled Off the Rails, from Frontier Development, like its predecessor, and a PSP exclusive release from Rebellion Developments named Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron. It wasn't until 2008 that LucasArts saw finally an internal effort being praised with more than 7 million copies sold, becoming the fastest selling Star Wars game to that moment. Star Wars The Force Unleashed was the result of a combination of four concepts that were scrapped around 2005. Even so, it was supposed to be released a year before, along with a new Indiana Jones title. The problem was that LucasArts couldn't find enough programmers that knew how to develop games for the new PlayStation 3. Everyone knows that Gabe Newell from Valve publicly stated that it was a waste of time to develop games for the PS3, and that Team Ico went through hell to put The Last Guardian together while developing it for that system. And as a Sony partner, they had all the ingredients to pull it off. 
In consequence, half of the team working on that Indiana Jones project was moved to the Force Unleashed to get the job done for a 2007 release, pushing Indy to a 2008 release. But even so, they ran into problems going beyond 2007. By that time, when all teams were starting to join forces to create the most spectacular Indiana Jones video game ever, Naughty Dog released Uncharted that was all that the new Dr. Jones game was meant to be. Everyone at LucasArts just stood petrified looking at Nathan Drake and thinking that they've missed completely the chance of making something great. In my final hour. The fate of Indy's new game will be told later on. So, besides the late release of Star Wars The Force Unleashed by September of 2008, a few other titles saw the light of day. LEGO Indiana Jones The Original Adventures developed by Traveler's Tales and TT Fusion for practically every gaming system available, being extremely well received. Star Wars The Clone Wars Jedi Alliance developed by LucasArts as a Nintendo DS exclusive. Star Wars The Clone Wars Lightsaber Duels, a Wii exclusive title that takes advantage of the Wii Remote to simulate lightsaber control and a nunchuck to use force powers. And Fracture, a title developed by Day One Studios that was designed as a first-person shooter since the beginning and when it was way far into development, the executives at LucasArts decided that it should be turned into a third-person shooter. Needless to say that making all those changes so far in development ended up destroying Fracture. By 2009, works on the sequel to The Force Unleashed was underway and the development team was pushed to complete it within a year. Between that, Star Wars The Clone Wars Republic Heroes was released for all systems, revealing itself as a huge flop with some frustrating platforming elements and terrible graphics. Even so, the revival of The Secret of Monkey Island in a special edition grabbed a few awards in 2009 and was highly praised by gamers that grew up with the original. This remaster includes an updated and drawn art style for higher resolutions with huge improvements in animation and sound, and we can even at any moment switch between the original game and the remastered version in real time. Two years after the release of Uncharted, Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings was finally in store shelves in a completely unrecognizable way and the HD versions were nowhere to be seen. These were cancelled due to obvious reasons and only the Wii, PS2, PSP and Nintendo DS versions saw the light of day. The only cool thing about this title is the inclusion of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis in the Wii version as an unlockable extra. Not very welcomed either was LEGO Indiana Jones 2 The Adventure Continues, again from Traveler's Tales and TT Fusion, probably because half of the game was based in the worst movie of the franchise, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Late 2009 also saw the release of Lucidity, a puzzle platformer available through Steam and Xbox Live Arcade, an original LucasArts title with amazing art style but short on its engagement with the player. Rebellion developments also returned in 2009 with their new PSP and DS entry on the Star Wars universe with the bland Battlefront Elite Squadron. LucasArts president left in May of 2010, being temporarily replaced by Jerry Bowerman from Lucasfilm Board of Directors. Later in the year and meeting the tight deadline imposed by LucasArts executives, Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2 was released surprisingly having its best version on the Wii. The HD versions looked really poor, like if they were rushed through development, completely failing to its high expectations. This led to layoffs within the company and it was time for Paul Megan to step in. By that time, Bioware was already working on a successor to Knights of the Old Republic 2 The Sith Lords, a MMORPG simply named Star Wars The Old Republic that is gossiped around the web that it might have cost near 200 million dollars to make, with every cent coming from Bioware's and Electronic Arts pockets, this last one working as its publisher. 
LucasArts made some pretty stupid calls in recent past, but the Bioware deal was the smartest move LucasArts ever made. 2010 also saw a remastered version of Monkey Island 2 that arose after the overwhelming success of the HD version of Secret of Monkey Island featuring all those enhancements, only ditching the easy mode for reviewers. From 2011 to 2013, LucasArts catalog was practically non-existent, with only LEGO Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars and Star Wars The Old Republic. During that period, Several plans were on the table, plans that were taking advantage of Epic Games and Real Engine 3, but even so, those plans were suffering constant changes. It was also by this time that George Lucas became heavily involved in all LucasArts internal projects. A new Bounty Hunter title was on development, highly inspired by the Uncharted series, most likely using the concept behind the initial cancelled HD versions of Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. A few weeks before the 2012 edition of V3, George Lucas ordered some severe changes on that concept, that the teams behind the project only had time to rename it to Star Wars 1313, supposedly a game based on the novel Boba Fett Maze of Deception. Fans were blown away by the demo presented at E3 and when asked directly about the game, LucasArts representatives present at the fair simply didn't know what to say about Boba Fett being the main character. It was clearly a next-gen video game targeted for PC, PS4 and Xbox One, but LucasArts didn't even confirm that. Then Paul Megan left his present chair at LucasArts, bringing two other names into co-lead the studio and shared the same chair. Kevin Parker and Gio Corsi. Then silence stroke upon LucasArts and Lucasfilm Limited, and by October 30 of 2012, Disney announced that it had acquired Lucasfilm and LucasArts, revealing also that three new movies were in the horizon. Today, I am proud to announce the Walt Disney Company is acquiring Lucasfilm, the global entertainment company founded by George Lucas and the home of the legendary Star Wars franchise. Bob Iger also stated that Disney wanted to focus on social and mobile experiences over console titles, so LucasArts was foreseeing a bright new future in the hands of Disney. But unexpectedly, on April 3 of 2013, Disney announced that it was closing LucasArts. The last game released by LucasArts as a subsidiary of an independent Lucasfilm was Connect Star Wars. LucasArts ceased to operate as a video game developer and future games based on its properties would be either developed by Disney Interactive Studios or licensed to third-party developers. LucasArts remained open with around 10 employees, retaining its function as a video game licensor after witnessing 150 staff members being laid off. Along with LucasArts, also Industrial Light and Magic lost many of its workers. Meanwhile, and as everyone knows, Electronic Arts grabbed an exclusive multi-year license to develop Star Wars games for PC and consoles, and Disney Interactive Studios would have also the right to further develop games based on that same franchise, but for mobile, social, tablet and online game markets. LucasArts, like any other developer, had a darker side. For every game released, there were two or three that never made it to players' hands. Sequels to their most famous graphic adventures were scrapped. For instance, Loom would be followed by Forge, expanding over the original and with an industrial theme. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis would have a sequel subtitled The Iron Phoenix, with Indy chasing after the Philosopher's Stone, and in early 2000s, Full Throttle 2 Alan Wheels 
and Sam and Max 2 Freelance Police were also cancelled due to some negative reactions to the game's dated 3D graphics. When the rights to the Sam and Max franchise expired in 2005, Steve Purcell, the creator of Sam and Max, regained ownership, licensing it to Telltale Games to develop Sam and Max Save the World as an episodic game. Apart from these, there were also, as told, a ton of Star Wars related ideas that were completely abandoned during the 90s and 2000s. It's unsure about the fate of Star Wars First Assault, but as for Star Wars 1313, Kathleen Kennedy told in an interview back in December of 2015 that the game was gold and it was something worth spending a lot of time looking at, pouring through, discussing and we may very well develop these things further. Many other studios were founded by former LucasArts employees during the last 17 years, such as Double Fine Productions, Telltale Games, Monkey Fun, Dynamite and Soma Play. Also, recent remasters by Double Fine of Grim Fandango, Day of the Tentacle and Full Throttle are proof of how big the name LucasArts was. A Day of the Tentacle Special Edition was supposedly on development at LucasArts Singapore by the time of Disney's acquisition and Tim Schafer credited LucasArts and Disney for their help in creating the remaster. Also, the recently released Thimbleweed Park is another proof that LucasArts spirit lives on. Looking back at 31 years of history, LucasArts left a legacy of amazing titles from the classic point-and-click adventure games and flight simulators to their incredible portfolio of Star Wars titles that covers a multitude of different genres that will prevail in the memory of gamers for many years to come. So guys, this wraps up the story of LucasArts, an epic and overwhelming study that took me weeks to put together, but by the end, it was totally worth it. I truly hope that you've enjoyed it, and nothing gives me more strength to continue doing these videos than your amazing and inspiring feedback. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode.